Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Paul Wilson, Executive Director of Planning, Business Development and International Relations at Index Holding and a member of the HUD International Scientific Board, DISA. Welcome to this evening's webinar brought to you by Waterfalls Education in collaboration between DHAD and the United Nations. We are delighted to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Dina Asaf, UN United Nations Resident Coordinator for the United Arab Emirates. Dr. Asaf has been with the United Nations for over 20 years in various senior management positions and advisory roles in both the UN headquarters, supporting the Arab region and in country offices. She has worked with the United Nations Development Programme, UNDP, United Nations Entity for Gender, Equality and the Empowerment of Women, UN Women, United Nations Department of Peacekeeping, UNDPKO, and the United Nations Sustainable Development Group, UNSDG. While with the UNSDG, Dina was the Deputy Director of the Development Operations Coordination Office, DOCA. While with the UN Women, Dr. Asaf was the Regional Director for the Arab States and worked to promote gender equality and the empowerment of women in the Arab region. While with UN Women, she spearheaded a new regional strategy to strengthen the economic, political and social rights of women in the Arab region. Prior to joining the UN, Dr. Asaf was in a leadership role in establishing the national development planning process for Palestine and led Palestine's first several national development plans. She has also held academic positions as well as advisory roles in civil society. Dr. Asaf is an engineer with degrees in architecture, urban design and urban planning. Dr. Asaf is a Palestinian and American and is fluent in both English and Arabic. The topic for today's webinar is COVID-19, is there a coordinated whole of UN response? Ladies and gentlemen, you will see at the bottom of your screen a Q&A button um, throughout the presentation. Feel free to send some questions on the presentation and we will do our best later on to ask Dr. Asaf your questions. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Dr. Asaf, Dina, to the uh, this evening's webinar. Good to see you and over to you, Dina, for your presentation. Thank you. Dr. Asaf, your microphone, please. <laughs> well, that was a nice practice. I get to, I get to start over again. Anyway, um, thank you again for uh, the invitation. Uh, I want to give a thanks to you for uh, the invitation today and to Dihad and to Disab and to Index Holding for uh, this great opportunity to reach out to your audience. And I look forward to our discussion today. Um, it's really important to see how we've utilized these platforms to allow us to engage on important issues such as this, and that even though we weren't able to hold the Dihad uh, uh, conference in uh, the UAE this year, we still are coming together. So this is a great opportunity. I look forward to our discussion today. I have a presentation uh, that I'll use to uh, outline uh, the key topics around uh, the discussion today. And like you said, then when, when uh, we have um, the Q&A section, we can uh, clarify anything that would help to clarify for colleagues. Let me just turn on the presentation. There we go. And let me just, oops, sorry about that. Going back, just wanted to minimize the picture that I have. So I'm not, okay, sorry about that colleagues. Um, uh, so uh, the key uh, point of this presentation is around the coordinated approach of the United Nations towards COVID. I feel very honored to be able to uh, take this opportunity to uh, share what the United Nations is doing as a whole uh, and to uh, also highlight the work that's being done by the UN across the world. And so this presentation will give an overall summary of how the UN is uh, approaching its uh, support to the planet um, and I hope that this will also clarify some, of, some, some questions that some, some of you may have. Now, as the title of the presentation indicated, is there a coordinated approach? And of course, the answer is yes. Now, here, what we will see uh, on the first slide here is three of the key uh, pillars or p appeals that the United Nations is coordinating across the world. As we all know, uh, this uh, pandemic took us all by, by uh, surprise 
and meaning in the sense of its extent and the impact it's having across the world at the same time. Within the United Nations, you know, coordination around a variety of issues, especially when there's a humanitarian crisis, as an example, which many of you are aware of and are working in these areas, uh, we do so at the country level. What makes this different uh, is the fact that we are seeing a situation, of course, that is hitting uh, countries around the world all at the same time. So it's a global coordination effort that is required, not only a country level coordination. So from the UN's perspective, uh, we have uh, very quickly uh, developed three uh, areas where the focus of the UN is being placed. The first is on a humanitarian, uh, the humanitarian aspect, uh, and it's a humanitarian appeal that's been put together, a humanitarian plan. And as you can see here, it's called the Global Humanitarian Response Plan. WHO is leading on the uh, response plan around health. And then there's the third one, which is around the socioeconomic impact of COVID or the development uh, plan, uh, which is being led by the Development Coordination Office and UNDP. And I, and I should have said, of course, that the humanitarian plan is being led by OCHA. Now I'll get into a little more specifics now. So, the humanitarian response plan obviously is related to humanitarian impact that's that due to COVID. 63 countries were identified as being the hardest hit uh, by the uh, pandemic uh, and additional support uh, and plans were put in place to see how to mitigate the humanitarian crisis uh, coming upon uh, millions of people due to, uh, due to the pandemic. The health response uh, or health plan that's led by WHO is to strengthen the resilience and some of the health deficits that we know already exist in countries, but then were further exacerbated by this pandemic. And the socioeconomic framework uh, is, a, is the analysis of the United Nations on the socioeconomic issues that are being impacted by the pandemic uh, specifically, so that vulnerabilities that we've had before have become even more uh, uh, vibrant, I would say, and visible uh, due to the pandemic. And the question is, is what things, need, what things need to be addressed now in the immediate sphere over the next six months to uh, 18 months uh, to ensure that uh, economies don't completely collapse, that risks that are being uh, placed on communities socially or economically are addressed. So these, are, these, these plans are coordinated approaches that the UN is doing uh, in all countries that are, they're engaged in around the world. So more specifically on the humanitarian plan, uh, this tells you here what the three strategic priorities are of the humanitarian plan. As you can see here on the slide, it's, it's focusing on decreasing morbidity and mortality, addressing deterioration of human human assets and rights and issues of social cohesion and assisting refugees and IDPs and migrants, etc. Now you'll see on the right of the slide, uh, it, the graphic that's in yellow. And what it's representing here for you is that, of course, there are humanitarian uh, uh, crises ongoing prior to the COVID impact. And already from OCHA's uh, uh, efforts in that regard, they have an appeal out at uh, different appeals in different countries to, to close to $40 billion. Here you can see it says 36.69 billion. And the, uh, and the impact of COVID uh, upon the humanitarian situations in countries has added another 7 billion or uh, plus uh, to the needs of countries and has also added additional countries who were not in a humanitarian crisis to the list. Uh, you'll also notice in the, in, the, in the table that shows the figures that uh, there's a funding gap as of now to close to $6 billion. So that's a very huge gap. And we'll be talking a little bit more about the financing as we go forward. WHO's plan uh, is coordinating across the world for, to, build, to address key risks in the health systems and health infrastructure in different countries specifically related to the pandemic. 
Uh, their plan is close, uh, is about 1.74 billion um, and they've raised about 1 billion and have the 700 million left approximately um, to address these key high level risks that were identified. And the eight pillars of this response plan, as you can see on the slide, uh, deal with uh, uh, country level coordination, communication, surveillance issues, points of entry, laboratories, dealing with infection uh, prevention and control, et cetera. Um, and these are all, uh, of course, key areas to ensure that the pandemic is managed and that we don't find things getting worse uh, than, than they currently are. On the right, we are just indicating here, of course, that health, the health sector is not going to be dealt with solely by WHO. This is just additional support to countries. So national governments, of course, are working uh, in this area uh, with, as, as per their normal uh, uh, efforts. And this is additional support. Uh, and of course, then uh, the partners through the United Nations and others to try to augment what the national governments are already doing. On the socioeconomic side, this was uh, identified, like I would say, about a month into the pandemic, or maybe a few weeks, not even a whole month after the declaration of the pandemic in February, uh, the Secretary, the United Nations Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, identified that, yes, of course, we have the humanitarian crisis that's happening, that's being imposed upon the already humanitarian uh, issues in a variety of countries. We have the health issues, which are obvious, that need to be addressed, and the health infrastructure. But then on top of that, uh, immediately, once the pandemic uh, was continuing and countries started to lock down, uh, and as we all know, the various economies around the world were being infected, uh, as well as various social, uh, uh, socioeconomic issues and social, social issues were being identified. Uh, it was realized that as the United Nations, we couldn't stop at just health and humanitarian and had to ensure that we also uh, looked at the risks and the issues that were coming and surfacing uh, due to the pandemic uh, in all areas. So this included, and we're focusing now, of course, it says here, health services and systems, and this is for longer term resilience, social protection and basic services, protecting jobs and small and medium uh, sized enterprises, macroeconomic response and multilateral collaboration, and social cohesion and community, community resilience. And what's really important here is to stress the fact that we're looking at to see what is the impact that the pandemic has had on a country and how do we ensure a coordinated and prioritized approach uh, to help the country mitigate the impacts of the pandemic. Here we're estimating on top of other development work that's already ongoing in the country, an estimated two to $3 billion, uh, uh, knowing that this is not a, a short term only for the next year or two, but also will need to continue after that. Um, here, I, I just wanted to demonstrate through a slide just to indicate that even though there are three uh, different plans, meaning humanitarian, health, and uh, socioeconomic, they are complementary. And the parts that overlap in the sense of health, for example, are also coordinated between the different plans. So the United Nations puts a lot of effort in ensuring a coherent and coordinated approach in the countries that it is working. And, addi and additionally, for those of you who may or may not know, the United Nations has a variety of sources of funding. We talked about uh, the uh, funding gaps that are there. Uh, and of course, uh, this will, this will countries will continue to see how to support the various appeals that are in place. So here on the slide, it's demonstrating the different types of funding sources that are available to address the different types of appeals. We have uh, several different trust funds that have been put in place. And of course, uh, the different uh, parts of the inter uh, international financial institutions, such as the World Bank and others will also be engaged, uh, et cetera, et cetera. I would also like to add here uh, that at the country level, the United Nations is already engaged as well as other partners and reprioritization of where funds are being allocated is also being addressed to, to 
mitigate higher level risks at this time. Now, um, the uh, Jihad conference that we were going to have this year was going to be focused on Africa. So I decided to just add a few slides about the situation in Africa in honor of the uh, uh, program that we were all pursuing earlier. And also because the humanitarian appeal and plan that we have is covering uh, almost half of it is, in, uh, is to support countries in Africa. So as I mentioned, 63 countries uh, are currently part of the humanitarian appeal, 30 of which are, are in Africa, representing 45% of the plan. And we have 60% of, of, of African countries are food insecure. And as many of you know, the pandemic uh, started later in, in many African countries and is now starting to build up. Uh, so it's really important that we uh, make traction in these countries now before things get much worse. Uh, the statistics here are, are estimates, of course, that are being provided by, by different authorities, but this can, of course, change over time. And we would hope that, of course, none of these numbers come true. Additionally, here uh, we can see the statistics that are as of, as of this week, uh, where we are. We have 53 countries affected in Africa by the pandemic. <clears throat> uh, there's over 3,000 deaths and it's growing because as we know, uh, for many countries, the, pan the uh, virus uh, came later uh, uh, and is hitting them now. Health workers are being affected, et cetera. And, and I thought it was important to also indicate some of the health infrastructure issues that some countries in Africa are facing. Uh, as as, uh, as I, don't, I don't have it here on the slide, but one of the facts that I also have is, for example, in Kenya, uh, which is a very large country of about 15 million people, uh, 15 million people uh, in that, uh, we have uh, only 155 IC, ICU beds supposedly there. We also see here that uh, Nigeria, uh, which has reported fewer, fewer than 500 in total, what, uh, as far as ventilators are being available, we have in Central African Republic only three ventilators, supposedly. These are the stats that I've been provided. Uh, hopefully, these things will change as we go, through, go, go forward. But not having medical supplies to address the pandemic is, of course, extreme high risk and one of the areas that needs to be addressed through this humanitarian appeal. So Africa has a lot of risks that we want to mitigate and we want to ensure that the peoples there are uh, supported as soon as possible. Um, this slide is, provides you uh, additional links that of course later on when the, when the presentation is shared you can uh, use these links to get more information uh, on any of these appeals if you're so interested. Also, if you uh, want to contribute or engage in some form. Now, additionally, in addition to the appeals, coordination is not just uh, about plans. Uh, plans are important, of course, prioritization of where efforts need to be is critical. But in addition, uh, there are other things that also the United Nations needs to ensure coordination of. And one area that came uh, forward and was quite clear uh, was the issue of procurement. And I'm sure many of you will remember at the beginning of the pandemic and when we all went into lockdown in different countries, uh, there was much talk about the lack of PPE availability, lots of news items I was seeing about the, the lack of, of access to ventilators. So even if countries wanted to purchase them, they, they didn't have, there weren't, the supply chain was broken, there was nowhere to find them or it was difficult to do so. Uh, the closure of borders uh, in countries made it difficult to even get supplies into a country or into a region, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so from the United Nations side, uh, it became very clear that we needed to have a coordinated approach on, uh, uh, in the supply chain as well as uh, procurement. And so therefore the UN under WHO's uh, overall oversight, it has a coordinated approach to procurement uh, for all medical supplies and support to countries uh, for this pandemic. 
This ensures that the United Nations is not, is, uh, not only coordinated for the sake of coordination, but, it, but is also uh, able to get the best prices, uh, is also able to ensure that countries that are in dire need get prioritized for supplies when, our, when they're needed, et cetera. And we're not working at cross purposes uh, in our efforts to help countries. Another area that's critically important and needs to be coordinated is information. And this was also a very important issue uh, that has come up over the months. Uh, whereas, where do you find the right information? How do you ensure that information is accurate, even the data that's being shared? Um, so here I'm sharing for you uh, specifically the WHO website, uh, which is really, uh, uh, for us, uh, the main source for information on this pandemic, as well as additional uh, links to specific networks of information they have. Of course, there's much more there, but I would strongly encourage you to use WHO's website uh, for uh, source information around the pandemic, uh, and uh, to uh, clarify whether uh, information you are receiving is accurate or not. So for us, coordination around information is very important as the UN and ensuring that any information that we disseminate uh, is accurate and, uh, and as up-to-date as possible. So within that also, the Secretary General recently launched, I think it's only been a few weeks now, uh, a campaign called Verified, and this website is really important. I would strongly suggest that everyone subscribe to this. This is now a service being provided through the United Nations where the information, any information that you receive through this website and with the logo Verified uh, check check, as you see there with the UN logo check check, means that this information has been verified by the United Nations to be true and to be factual. And this has become really important at these times where a lot, there is information out there being circulated uh, that is uh, not factual. And as we know, in such uh, uh, situations that we're in as a pandemic, information uh, is critical uh, and accurate information is critical to be reached to the public. So this uh, campaign and this uh, uh, website, I think, uh, will help uh, all of us to ensure that the information that we have uh, is accurate and, and we can count on the facts that we're reading. So strongly suggest uh, that you uh, subscribe to this website. And finally, this is my last slide. I wanted to stress the sustainable development goals. And I'm sure that all of you online are aware of the sustainable development goals, but this is to remind us that this, the sustainable development goals uh, are, are not behind us. They are part and parcel of everything we're doing, including during this pandemic. And what was identified in the sustainable development goals not only is uh, uh, valid, but even more so valid. The targets that we identified in each country uh, where the deficits uh, lied in the various uh, SDGs uh, just became more exacerbated by the pandemic. So I reiterate the fundamental basis of the Sustainable Development Goals. And as the United Nations, we use the Sustainable Development Goals as our guiding uh, light, I will say. And, I, and the two principles that I've put on here uh, clearly also um, are highlighted further by this pandemic, which is the universality principle, meaning that the SDGs apply to all countries. And as we've seen, this pandemic applies to all countries. Uh, and leave not, leaving no one behind, the principle of leaving no one behind, meaning all peoples in a country uh, are, uh, are important. Uh, everyone uh, needs to be served by the SDGs, not just some people, some places. And this then also becomes even more evident during this pandemic, where we must ensure that all peoples are being supported and helped uh, during the pandemic. It's not just some people. The only way we're going to get through this pandemic is if all of us get through this pandemic. Uh, and therefore, the leaving no one behind principle uh, applies here even more. So again, the sustainable development goals are at the core of our business uh, and all of our work, uh, regardless of where, what we do. And for all of you who are online and listening today, uh, this is also part of, your, part of your work. So that's a reminder for all of us. 
So I'll stop here and uh, welcome the discussion that follows. I'll stop the, uh, the presentation at this, at this stage, right, uh, Paul? Yes, Dina, thank you very much. Um, very interesting and thank you for trying to put a, a huge amount of information into a, a, a presentation, as you say, it's a mammoth task. So uh, as the UN resident coordinator, um, you have several different UN offices that um, you're involved with. So um, information is one thing and interesting to see the uh, shareverified.com. Maybe we'll come back to that later, how we share information. I'm thinking more along resources in the short term. So is there a particular department of the UN, uh, whether it's UN OCHA or UNHCR, that would you say over the last four or five months has been more impacted perhaps than and other departments and where resources you mentioned perhaps some budget changes uh, which part of the UN do you feel is really uh, having to um, find a new a new energy a new strategy in this COVID well I mean uh, thank you very much for that question um, I think it would be very difficult to uh, say uh, categorically who is affected more because everyone is affected, obviously. And in fact, every country is affected uh, and everyone is having to reprioritize and re, uh, figure out how to deal with the, with the impact of the pandemic. But saying so, uh, we know that the most vulnerable populations in the world uh, are of course even more impacted uh, by the pandemic. Everyone is impacted obviously, but just imagine uh, if you're a person who lives in a country uh, who, who, who only can survive by working every day, meaning you, you're, you know, you're one, of, one of the people who is under the poverty level making less than a dollar a day. And if you don't make that dollar, your family doesn't eat. And the only way you make that dollar is, is going and, and doing daily informal jobs uh, and so on. And if you're in a lockdown and not allowed to do that, how does your family survive? So the point is, is that there are gonna be people who are more impacted than others in that sense, in the immediate sense. And therefore the UN agencies that are supporting these uh, populations then have the greater burden for the immediate emergency uh, that, they have to, that they will have to handle. So again, here you would see OCHA, for example, dealing with the humanitarian response, UNHCR, as you've indicated, dealing with refugees, are, I would say, ones that are having a much harder time. You also have UNRWA, uh, who supports the Palestinian refugees. Uh, all of them are having a much tougher time because of the vulnerability of the populations they support. Thank you, Dina. And, uh, in terms of uh, funding, you mentioned some figures which are, you know, uh, very, very large figures. The thing that struck me was the word gap. And yeah. uh, do you, uh, are you concerned slightly uh, with the fact that this also hit what we call the more of the West, the developed countries, if you like, you know, Spain, these countries that for the first time, maybe in a long time, we had some of these countries which uh, have resources, have have money, had their own uh, uh, have their own issues to deal with internally. Does that affect the budgeting at all, or the impact on raising funds? Well, of course. I mean, as we know, um, countries are dependent uh, on. I mean, when we say funding gap, well, who, where does the funding come from? It has to come from someplace, uh, and so we all know who work in these areas that certain countries around the world are, are what we call donor countries, such as you mentioned, Spain and England, and Britain, and so on and so forth. Um, these are what we call donor countries. And if they're being impacted by the pandemic themselves, of course, this is gonna have an impact on their ability to support. But countries have been very generous uh, up to this point in, in, uh, because they realize that this is a world pandemic. And if one country, uh, even just one country, continues to suffer, all of us will suffer. I'm noticing on my screen that I look like I'm in the dark. The lights have gone down here. While you're asking the question, I'm gonna run and turn on the lights. I know it's a little informal, but I can see it's dark, just a second. You ask the next question. 
Okay, yes, we, we would like to see you, Dina. So that's that's great. Um, we, we've talked about uh, other countries. Uh, what we do know is that here in the United Arab Emirates, we have been, uh, uh, the country has, has been very active in humanitarian activity outside of the UAE borders. And uh, I have one question from a, a participant. Um, has the UN funded any number of airlifts with relief uh, going out of international humanitarian uh, city, the warehouse here in uh, UAE, Dubai? That's an excellent question and thank you for the question. In fact, the United Arab Emirates, as you've noticed, uh, as you have indicated, has been quite generous uh, in supporting a variety of countries around the world. Being the United Nations resident coordinator for the UAE, I'm proud to be able to say that for the country that I'm supporting. The, the UAE it specifically has supported over 63 countries uh, with uh, medical assistance and some of the support of those countries has gone through the United Nations. So we have here the International Humanitarian City and I know there was a webinar uh, several weeks ago with the head of the IHC here where we have as the UN, uh, the World Health Organization, the World Food Program, UNHCR, UNICEF based as well to provide emergency aid around the world. Uh, the UAE provides that platform for the United Nations with Dubai being a very important hub. So in specific answer to your question, yes, uh, the WHO office here that provides uh, logistical support to countries, over 80% uh, of WHO's uh, medical support to countries for the pandemic has come through Dubai. And the UAE has supported some of that directly. Thank you, Dina. Yes, absolutely. We, we talked, you talked about the UN's role in terms of uh, procurement, which is, uh, is key to this. Uh, it's, it's not a just, not, we, we have an issue with products, PPE, ventilators across the world, but it's also about getting your hands on it and, and, and paying for it, right? So we're hearing different stories uh, around uh, the procurement issue. Has, can the UN play a role in um, uh, form of legislation or a global position on price management, or is that a, a, a real challenge to, I wouldn't say enforce, but to collectively agree on a, a price point? Yeah, I see what you're saying. I mean, what I think, that's why I think the United Nations uh, created the common uh, coordinated approach to procurement, because we didn't want to be bidding against each other, you know, in the market. Um, you know, because, because, you know, in the end, it's a market. Uh, the United Nations, as the United Nations, can't control uh, prices of individual vendors because there's the independence of each country and of private sector uh, independence. However, we can manage how procurements are done, and that's, again, why the common procurement platform uh, managed by WHO is so critical because countries are coming to the United Nations asking us to help them to secure, you know, medical equipment or ventilators or, or whatever. Uh, we want to make sure that we're part of the solution and that we don't find ourselves becoming used uh, to be part of the problem where prices get uh, elevated on. So by having a coordinated approach, uh, we can ensure that we get uh, the keep the prices at a reasonable uh, level. Sure, thank you. I mean, as we see, uh, hopefully, the scaling down of some of the, uh, the operations in, in, uh, in the countries that had their, hopefully, their peaks, there's a lot of equipment there. A lot of ventilators were manufactured, PPE was manufactured. Do you see an opportunity for uh, that as a basic collaboration in terms of lifting some of those equipment to countries that are perhaps still coming into their, uh, their peaks or... or the COVID is on the road. This is a very important role that WHO plays, as well as WFP, for example. And I mentioned WFP, even though it's the, as it is the World Food Program, but it also provides a very important role in logistics in getting things to the places they need to be. So between WHO and WFP, they've even partnered together to ensure that supplies can be. Uh, um, uh, purchased and uh, arrive to where they need to be. Uh, 
this is uh, where WHO um, can support countries to not only locate, but ensure receipt of quality goods. Uh, that's also very important. You don't want to find yourself purchasing something you think that you're purchasing and find out that it's not what you thought it was or the quality is not something you could use because here we're talking about people's health. So it's really critical that uh, uh, there's some form of quality control as well of the procurement process. So these are some of the roles that the UN plays that sometimes the public doesn't know. Um, the UN plays a variety of roles in supporting the planet, in, in coordinating and finding solutions, uh, even during this pandemic, as you're speaking now on procurement, in trying to find this, uh, realizing the damage this, to the supply chain and trying to find uh, mechanisms to not only locate, but how to get things to move from place to place with the borders closed in different places. So these are, these are some of the things that we, we do. And I really congratulate my colleagues. Uh, it's really tough. I mean, for those of you who are online here uh, in the United Arab Emirates, as we know, we locked down in March. My colleagues who work in WHO and the IHC, for example, uh, they, can, they ended up staying and living at the uh, warehouses because they couldn't come and go home. It wasn't safe for them. So, but it was so important that the supplies reach people when they had to. Uh, they ended up having to set up uh, sleeping arrangements in the humanitarian uh, city uh, where they were working so that they could continue to support countries in the emergencies that they were in. So these are some of the things that UN staff do. Yeah, and uh, I think talking about your colleagues and, and, and friends, of course, and, and co-workers, maybe that's a nice uh, way to talk about collaboration. Are we seeing an, an, a new movement in collaboration? I know you have existing collaborations. You've mentioned uh, NGOs, Red Crescent, uh, I think, and uh, uh, across the world. Is this a time for collaborations? I want to say more than ever because we've had other issues in the past, but it's maybe focused the, the mind a little because it's been so global. Of course. I mean, the thing is, is we all, I mean, what's, I say unique in a way, at least in my lifetime, maybe somebody else has had other experiences, but I see that this is a very unique uh, situation. We hear this from many people. This isn't just me that's saying this because all of it, it's happening to all of us at the same time. I mean, we, for those of us who work in this area of humanitarian support or development, you know, you, you work and you support a particular country, you may move from one country to another country, and we know the issues that different countries face. But for the whole world to go through the same thing at the same time has an impact that has not ever happened before. Because as we know, especially when we work in the humanitarian field, there can be some apathy from other people in other countries. They go, oh, well, that's them over there. That's not me. I have my own stuff I have to do. I have to go to the park. I have to work. I have to pay my bills. Um, and it feels far away. But now it's affecting everyone. So we have this common language now that we never had before. Now, of course, the impact is different from country to country, person to person, family to family. But there is some commonality to what this is doing to all of us. Uh, it, it, it'll help with the language. It'll help with the understanding that we can't ignore populations. We can't ignore certain countries or even people in our communities just because it's not impacting me. As we see with this pandemic and this virus, it's invisible, right? So none of us can see where it is. Uh, and so therefore, anyone in our community who is impacted impacts you as well. But this then translates to all things, not just the pandemic. What is the analogy here? When we talk about climate change, doesn't that impact everyone? Uh, when we talk about uh, poverty and people suffering from poverty in our communities, we can see now that that all impacts everyone. So I think there's many things that we can learn from this experience that'll help people to dialogue around it that maybe before they didn't fully understand, you know, or maybe they didn't feel it the same. I'm seeing that we can have a common language here that we can draw from this experience that'll help us all propel forward in a way that I'm hoping will take humanity in a much positive 
more positive way. This is, this is my personal and professional hope. So better am collaborations. I, am, I, am I being overly optimistic? No, I you should always be optimistic. I think so too. That's, that's what great I to believe. start the day. <laughs> yeah, that, no, but that's, I, that's my belief. You have to be optimistic. You have to look forward. And I try to see, you know, what, for me, I've been very reflective during this period, and I'm sure many of us have. But I also, because of the area of work that I'm in, I can't help to see the analogies here. And I can't help to see that, hey, you know, this is making people wake up and see that the vulnerabilities that we had in our communities, for example, people who couldn't afford health care or infrastructures that weren't in place or social uh, protection mechanisms that weren't in place, this pandemic has shown that these weaknesses in our societies can have major impact major impact it's not just on those few people but it's on everyone and even if it was only on those few people but these are not things we can ignore anymore because we can't have this happen again so we have to learn from this and we have to see how do we build more resilient uh, communities countries economies uh, so that if we ever were to have such an experience again it would not hit us like this we have to learn from it Sure. We have a few questions coming in from our, uh, our audience, so I'd like to try and uh, uh, go through a few of those. Um, one of the questions we had, and you talked about everyone's impacted, but this question is, are there any gender issues within the spectrum of COVID-19 uh, responses, activities? And if so, what is the UN family's role and which organizations is taking the lead? Very good. Thank you. Thank you for bringing that up. In fact, uh, again, you know, we could go down the list of, of the variety of issues that are being impacted by, by the pandemic. And gender issues, of course, are being further exacerbated. As I said, any issues that existed before that we knew were a problem that needed to be addressed just got worse because of the pandemic. These weaknesses or vulnerabilities just came higher to the surface. So for example, with regards to uh, gender issues and women specifically, we've noticed unfortunately, very unfortunately, an uptake uh, in violence against women. Uh, this is, was something even the Secretary General uh, has spoken about because it was extremely alarming to see the, the heightened uh, increase of violence against women uh, in all spheres of life. And this is just not acceptable, of course, uh, in, the, in the UN, uh, UN Women is our lead uh, on these issues, but of course other agencies work on it as well, as gender is mainstream across our work, but UN Women is the main lead. So we, we, this is an area of great concern. There's also issues around uh, trafficking uh, that has increased. You can imagine uh, people who are vulnerable in different ways now are even more vulnerable. Um, and so all of these things have become uh, of great concern. Um, thank you, Dina. Uh, what are some of the ways the UAE UN country team can work together to attract funding for the UN COVID-19 response from public and private partners in the United Arab Emirates? Yes, uh, we, we have here a variety of UN agencies that are uh, in the country here in the UAE. Some of them are of a regional nature and some are uh, working with the UAE specifically. And, and because of the partners that we have here, uh, this allows us to engage to see how maybe the UAE or the private sector here can further engage. We have here also the UN Global Compact. Uh, if you haven't heard of the UN Global Compact, you may want to look that up. Uh, because the UN Global Compact, they just finished uh, Monday, Tuesday, a, a global leadership summit. It was the first conference, I think, a global conference online that was lasted over uh, two full days going around the world. Uh, uh, it's it's going to be online. So if you haven't uh, seen it, you can fi find out more about it. The reason I mention it is the UN Global Compact works with the private sector. And here in the UAE, we have a local network. That's what it's called of a board of uh, uh, different companies here in the UAE who are working to see how to further leverage the private sector in the UAE uh, to support the SDGs. Now, of course, now due to uh, 
due to COVID, it gives them even a more directed uh, approach uh, or uh, area to engage. So we're trying to see how we can uh, mobilize also the private sector here, which is really unique in the UAE and quite vibrant uh, to engage in supporting uh, the planet. Thank you, Dina. Um, logistics, transport, nothing moves without logistics and transport. So how has the UN managed to tackle the lack of commercial air transport? Currently, uh, a situation faced by everybody. Yeah, well, I mean, this is, of course, a, a, a really odd situation for all of us. I mean, I, I, I don't have any recollection of not being able to get on a plane when I wanted to, other than not finding the ticket on the day I needed to travel. But if I wanted to, I could do it. Now I can't. Uh, that's a very odd uh, sense for all of us. Um, and of course, then this impacts our ability to assist countries and either through movement of people or movement of goods. Now in the UN, we, because of the heightened uh, uh, emergency, the World Food Program actually uh, has uh, its own, uh, some, um, airplanes. <laughs> I was like, what do I call it? It's called an airplane. Uh, <laughs> uh, where, uh, so we've mobilized and we've, we've agreed across the world uh, with certain countries to be able to allow the WFP, you know, even though their airports are closed, for the WFP uh, uh, airplanes and freight to be able to move from certain points around the world, to be able to move emergency goods and as well to transport people who need to uh, move due to you know for emergency support so this is uh, one of the mechanisms that WFP has put in place with the in coordination with governments uh, around the world uh, and it, it's a huge service I think that we're able to now provide to get goods from one place to the other um, and hopefully you know countries will open up soon and we won't have to use this approach, which is much more expensive, of course, to do it this way than the normal way. But of course, in this type of situation, you have to um, use what you have. Normally, we use these services of WFP in uh, you know, crisis situations in certain countries where there's a war or something like this, and we need to get things in and out, and, and there's no airplanes uh, working at that time. Uh, but now, of course, this has been mobilized for a much greater uh, support around the world. So thanks to WFP. Absolutely. Um, I'll, I'll mix a question from uh, a questioner and maybe something that was in my mind a little bit. I think they, they dovetail. We talked about moving equipment, but uh, one of the things, of course, and uh, one of our webinars the other, the other evening is the supply of oxygen. So it's all very well having certain equipment that works in a country, but you ship it to another country, you've got to be able to plug it in. You need, the, yeah, you know, the, I mean, the things that, like you said, some people just maybe don't think about. Yeah. And, and our questioner is talking, and you've already talked about how the vulnerable are always impacted more in situations like this already. Our questioner is talking about Nigeria, the rural dwellers um, who don't have access to good healthcare facilities and, um, they're also economically vulnerable. So the question with all of that in mind is, how do you collaborate with the government and development ages to reach out to these, these particular groups of people that, you know, in the rural uh, areas? Right. No, I hear you. Um, and this is the leave no one behind principle. So the United Nations in the countries that where we operate, uh, part of the work of the United Nations country team, which is made up of the different parts of the different agencies of the UN, part of the work that they need to do is a vulnerability analysis. So meaning, you can't just go, be in a country and only serve the capital. That doesn't make any sense, right? So you need to be able to know where are these vulnerable populations, as you just mentioned, or rural populations, or, or populations that are hard to access, or uh, minority groups who are maybe unknown because they're, you know, in some part of the country that is, is not connected, you know, somehow. So this is part of our normal work as the United Nations, whether the pandemic doesn't make it something we did just for now. This is part of our normal business. 
uh, meaning when we go to a country, our analytical work is to identify where there are vulnerabilities uh, and where the vulnerable, vulnerable populations are and how to reach them. So yes, that would be part of our strategy. So as an example, just a hypothetical example, if we were in a country X and there was a, ru a, a rural population um, that uh, was coming that didn't have access, one of the things we would do is to identify how to reach them, come up with a strategy, a transportation plan, whatever, to make sure that they also would receive access. They would be identified and, uh, and also included as part of the plan. Uh, so that's part of the work that the UN does. It's not easy, but it is something that is key to how we look at, look at our uh, work. You know, um, move away slightly from what's going on today. And uh, as you know, uh, DHAD, you're very much involved with DHAD and it will take place on the 15th to 17th of March uh, in uh, 2021. Um, we adapted uh, the theme uh, for the 17th edition to include aid after coronavirus, uh, a focus on Africa. Would you like to just give us your thoughts on that uh, theme? Yeah, I mean, uh, coming together after, I mean, next year for Dihad, I think will be really important. And as part of that uh, effort, and I'm sure that's part of the scope of the theme, and I would, I, would, I would second, is the whole issue of resilience. And what does it mean uh, for us? Uh, and what did we learn from this pandemic? Uh, how, can, how resilient we are and how did we build or how do we build resilience? How did, we, how did we build or how do we build resilience? As I said, one of the key things we want to ensure that we learn from this uh, pandemic is how to have it never happen to us again. Um, and so I believe the conference next year will serve a great purpose of bringing our minds together as to what did we experience, what did we learn from this, and how do we help ourselves to ensure we put things in place so it never happens to us again? Oh, I think you're on mute, Paul. Yeah. There we go. We both we both did it out there. We <laughs> well, it can't, be, it can't be just me. I mean, there thanks. you go. So I think we still have a couple of. Uh, few minutes for maybe a couple of questions. Um, uh, we've got one here. What lessons have you learned that can be positively contribute, that can positively contribute towards and also increase citizen activation within the corporates, uh, the communities and NGOs? Citizen, citizen activation. Well, I think this is a really important point that no solution happens Apologies for that. Uh, no solution happens uh, without everyone's involvement. This isn't, uh, uh, we're not going to find solutions by looking to someone else or to the other. I don't care who the other is. If you're looking to the government or you're looking to whoever you're looking to, the UN, for example. It's not just one entity or one person's or only a certain group of persons' uh, uh, problem to solve. All of us need to be engaged. And I think, as I said, since this is now uh, impacting all of us at the same time, it is also raising people's attention to what can I do and how do I engage? And I've seen across the world, they said, what did you see and what did you learn? I would say I saw the beauty of the human soul, if I may say it that way. I mean, all of us are seeing stories there. You see the news and you see the tragic stuff. But you also see the, the, the beautiful things, if I may put it that way, of people reaching out and figuring out how to help each other and how to support one another. How to, the smallest gesture makes a big difference for people in such situations as today. So this is what you're talking about, citizen activation. It's happening as we speak. And people are looking for ways to engage and they can. And it doesn't require much to make a difference in your community. So this is where I would say this was a big lesson learned is that we, some people thought it was too complicated to get involved. 
And I think they've learned that, no, it's not that complicated. You can actually make a difference and a big difference in your community and, and even in your own country. Thank you, Dina. Yes, and uh, I think we can do two more questions. Um, one person is asking about vaccines. Uh, we, we obviously uh, we, we hear about vaccines. When a vaccine uh, is available, uh, uh, hopefully sooner rather than later, hopefully. can the UN play any role in the uh, equita equitability availability or making it avail available on an equitable level? Yes, the Secretary General has already spoken about this. So this is already on our radar. So it's not something that, we'll, that, that we're not thinking about already. Uh, so the Secretary General, the Director General of WHO and others as well, I mean, so not only, you know, not only the Secretary General himself, have indicated that when a vaccine uh, is, uh, is, uh, is created and, uh, and made for us to use, the equitable distribution and use across the planet is key. So the UN is looking at how to support countries and global uh, coordination to ensure that there is a way for us to um, make sure the vaccine is available to all and not just to some countries. So this is high on the radar of the UN's uh, attention. So yes, I would say the UN will be playing a role on this. Oh, you're mute again. <laughs> Back, um, on and off. <laughs> uh, what's your message to the humanitarian community, your friends, colleagues, co-workers? Um, what would you say? Well, the first thing I would say is thank you. I mean, I think it's really important for, uh, for me and all of us to say thank you to all colleagues who are working in the humanitarian field. More than ever, has your job or your efforts uh, been uh, are, are important? I mean, they were important before and even more now. So we must say thank you. So I have to say thank you up first because, you know, I, I have gratitude for the efforts of my colleagues that work in this field, the stress levels that they have to undertake, uh, especially at this time, is exacerbated. But additionally, uh, I, I would also say that in this time, it's really important that as we're working on hu the humanitarian uh, uh, work, that we don't forget that it isn't alone. You, you know, we have the emergency needs that we have to address. We want to make sure people uh, uh, don't die uh, from starvation or, uh, or health needs or something of this nature that's immediate uh, humanitarian support. But also when we're putting together solutions and we're working towards helping uh, these communities uh, to always uh, look at what is the sustainability element and how does it connect to the longer term development of that country so that it isn't just a short term support, but a longer term sustainable infrastructure or something that we're setting up in that country to help carry things forward because that's part of the development solution. And then that links to the slides that I was showing where there was an overlap between, you know, the humanitarian health and development uh, plans, because there is, they're, they're all interconnected. They're all one and the same. Just as humans, our brains can only handle so much information. We have to compartmentalize things. But in reality, everything is intertwined. So for my humanitarian colleagues, a huge thank you. And wherever you can, please see how you can translate what you're doing into something that stays beyond the emergency support that you're providing. Thank you, Dina. So Dina, um, it's amazing how quickly one hour goes. And um, we, we, as always, I need to apologize because there are some more questions, but uh, time management is time management. So um, I'd like to say thank you so much for spending time with us. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure and uh, listening to you. I'd also like to thank Index Conference and Exhibitions, uh, DHAD and DSAB, but of course the United Nations and, and all the great work that you and your colleagues are doing all over the world in, uh, you know, uh, difficult times, difficult circumstances. So a big uh, shout out to all of those. So uh, Dr. Dean Asaf, thank you so much 
um, once again for spending time with us in the evening. I give you the last word and uh, thank yes. you. Well, thank you so much. I, I, I say to everyone online, thank you first of all for your time and taking the time to listen to our conversation today and to say that keep the hope and keep the vision for a better future. We will make that happen because all of us want that to happen. And I look forward to being part of that with everyone. And thank you again. And I'm glad to also be part of DISAB and look forward to our Dihad conference next year when we'll come forward together to show what we've done to make the world a better place. In the UN, we're saying build back better. That's our slogan now. Let's build back better. And uh, good luck, everyone. And thank you again. And thank you very much, Paul. Uh, great to be uh, having this conversation with you today. Thank you, Dina. It's been a pleasure. Thank you to our participants and have a lovely evening, Dina. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank bye you very bye. much. Bye, everybody. Bye.